We are at plenary session, um, the first plenary session of day two, as I said, which is teaching the show must go online. Um, and we've got two speakers on this panel, which is uh, Jeffrey R. Wilson and Rob Miles. So I'll just give you a quick introduction and then hand over to Jeff and Rob. So Jeffrey Wilson is a faculty member in the writing program at Harvard University, where he teaches the Why Shakespeare section of the university's first year writing course. He is the author of three books, Shakespeare and Trump, Shakespeare and Game of Thrones, and Richard III's Bodies from Medieval England to Modernity, Shakespeare and Disability History, which is forthcoming in 2022. His work has appeared in journals such as Modern Language, Language Quarterly, Genre and College Literature, and has been featured in public venues including National Public Radio, uh, Zocalo Public Square and MLA's Profession. And Rob Miles is a multi-award winning actor, writer and director and a member of the Shakespeare Theatre Association. Over 13 years as an actor, he has played a wide range of Shakespearean leading roles in national touring productions. His experiences led him to create the Shakespeare Deck, a powerful portable toolkit for classical actors to engage meaningfully with the text. Sold to date in the US, Canada, Australia, France, Germany, and in the Royal Court Bookshop in London. In 2020, Rob created The Show Must Go Online, which, of course, which is what we're here to, to hear about today. So I will leave Rob and Jeff to, uh, to cover that in due course. But Rob has also given talks at Harvard University, King's College London, Rhodes Cincinnati and more. And he has taught Shakespeare at East 15 Drama School. He's cracking the Shakespeare Code workshops sold out in London, Glasgow and online. So with the introductions done i will hand over to jeff and rob so when you're ready take it away thank you so much ben thank you so much everyone for being here with us this morning 6 a.m in the states <laughs> <laughs> oh we love it jeffrey thank you so much uh, for <laughs> getting yourself out of bed at that kind of time i'm not sure if i'd have been able to um hello everyone we're going to talk for approximately 40 minutes and then we're going to open the rest of it up uh, to a discussion which we hope is going to be lively and animated and all that kind of thing so uh, lovely to uh, kind of digitally make all of your acquaintances um here's some stuff and then we'll talk about the stuff so uh, jeffrey are we ready here we go Wonderful, here we go. So on March 19th, 2020, just eight days after the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic, as schools, offices, and theaters were shutting down, the Show Must Go Online launched its first socially distanced, fully online performance, The Two Gentlemen of Verona, featuring a cast assembled across multiple countries. Yeah. Yeah, uh, this shoe with the hole in it is my mother, and this, my father. Ha! Ah, a vengeance on it. There it is. Over the next nine months, we performed each of Shakespeare's 36 first folio plays online, one per week, every week, in the order that Wikipedia says they were believed to have been written. To be. Or not to be. Flash forward one year to March 2021, and the first year college students at Harvard University in our Why Shakespeare course have spent a month watching, studying, thinking, talking, and writing about the show must go online. So fitting for our entirely virtual class where none of us have met in person and we're <laughs> trying to analyze and have discussions so about So we considered how history. one grassroots organization scrambled to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, how new technology came into contact with older literature and culture, some of their surprisingly lo-fi performance solutions and the role of the arts during times of trouble. King, King Lear kind of gets to this point where um, he has an introspective journey and he, he sort of thinks that he has free range of action, an infinite will for most of the play and then realizes that, you know, jarringly, kind of suddenly that he, that he actually has limitations and that his circumstances are not quite as free as he thought. And that sort of, that sort of paralleled for me um, what has happened, I think, to, or what, you know, happened to um, a lot of people with, with COVID restrictions. 
DSM Joe's scramble to create a new kind of theatre with only the most rudimentary of readily accessible resources was paralleled in the Why Shakespeare class's journey to figure out how to study digital theatre in a fully online class and how the students' assignments and approaches evolved over time. So two days before the one year anniversary of the show must go online, Rob joins us for a marathon three hour session about how the series came together. Uh, but I put a tweet out very casually saying, maybe we should start a reading group on Zoom. Do it in the evenings UK time so US people can take part as well if they fancy it. What do you reckon? Put it out. Went, made dinner, didn't give it a second thought. Several hours later, went back to check Twitter and there were hundreds of likes so many retweets all this kind of thing there were replies from people all around the world being like oh my god yes i'm so in and so it was like huh, okay um so then this idea had to transform so rob describes so how the actors outmaneuvered zoom how their politically progressive approach engaged with the bigotry in shakespeare's plays and how they created community in an age of isolation we went from a midsummer night's dream and Bottom's asshead done with an Instagram filter of Donkey from Shrek to an uncanny performance of Cymbeline on November 4th, 2020, after the US presidential election, but before the results were known. Win or lose, actor Kevin B. Smith told a friend on the night of the election, I'll be getting into drag tomorrow. Do thou work. So come what may in digital theater, the show must go online will always be a landmark production. The first to take all of Shakespeare's plays online. What stands out even more is that the series transcended the world of Shakespearean theater to become a global community for art, conversation and human connection during a time when everyone was isolated, exhausted and anxious to know how our moment fit into the larger course of history. Bridging performance with scholarship and Shakespeare's time with our own, the series outmaneuver the polymorphous challenges of Corona times to create space for laughter, reflection, pathos, and learning more about ourselves and others. Perhaps most importantly, the show must go online, set a standard for future theater that is radically inclusive and committed to progress toward more truthful art and a more just society. Today, we're gonna to tell a few stories. We'll tell the story of The Show Must Go Online. We'll take you behind the screens to some backstage stories about our performances. We'll explore some of the many ways that you can utilize what we set out to create. Shakespeare for everyone, for free, forever. So we'll meet some of the students from the Why Shakespeare class and we'll hear their stories. And we'll provide you with some teaching materials gathered from beyond our class that can help you and your students create your own stories. And I'll just quickly note here, we're gonna do a number of video clips. Sometimes the quality can get a little bit choppy, but be sure to ask Rob about how TSMGO outmaneuvered some of the confines of Zoom later. So to get ready for this, to study the show must go online. We went back to our texts and our photos and our emails from March, 2020. We had a, a really good chat about what our archives revealed versus what we remembered. And returning to our lockdown scrambles really emphasized for us that it's so impressive that TSMGO did its first show on March 19th, 2020. We talked about how to study a Shakespeare play in 10 days, and this is a resource we'll share with you toward the end. And then our 19 students picked 19 different Shakespeare plays to read and study. We all got our own space to interact with, like, our texts. And, like, I mean, we were the only ones who read, like, that particular text and watch that particular play. And so I think that experience is really interesting. To so feel students like had to like, create three like minute summaries with topic. two requirements. They had to be highly informative and they had to be extremely entertaining. So we got an all's well that ends well in anime. We got Chris Hemsworth cast as Charles the Wrestler and As You Like It. We got flash films of Twelfth Night with a dog as Maria and Antony and Cleopatra with a dog as the snake. And we got original student poems on King Lear and Cymbeline. Students had to get creative to tell these stories. They recruited family members. They repurposed household objects. They made pre-recorded footage mixed with live footage. So this kind of anticipated some of the moves that the TSMGO actors were gonna to have to make in their performances. Having just studied Hamlet, we talked about how Kristen Atherton's use of makeup to signal madness in light of Hamlet's line to Ophelia, God hath given you one face, you make of yourselves another. We considered David Sterling Brown's introduction to TSMGO's Hamlet. How can we talk about race and Hamlet? And how 
can we use the play's characters to talk about race? That opened up questions about race conscious casting and TSMGO's performances. We toured some of the strategies that the production used to outmaneuver the limitations of socially distanced performances, like Kristen Atherton and Emilio Vieira's uh, handshake here. I'm glad to see you well. <laughs> Forget myself. When a student tried to share a screen and Zoom made him quit for a reinstall, it led to a discussion about how TSMGO handled tech difficulties. So consider the choppy signal here during Tandi Mari's uh, scene of Ophelia's madness. It was unintended, but really powerful. Beauteous majesty of Denmark. How now, Ophelia? We posed a number of questions as a springboard for studying the show must go online, including how did the production navigate the limitations of performing while socially distanced? How does the play, how does the play speak to life today, whether specifically Corona times or more broadly in the 21st century? How does the chat room add to the production and what sorts of conversations were appearing there? How does the performance's casting add new layers of meaning to the text? And especially this one, does an audience's enjoyment come more from seeing how the cast and crew tell the story than the actual story that Shakespeare wrote? It was only after students had written drafts of their essays that Rob joined us for a Q&A. So we had really targeted questions for him. Having uh, Mr. Miles actually come in here and talk to us one-on-one, -on -one, I think that actually allowed us to get a lot more depth in our paper than if we hadn't had that sort of primary source experience. There was like a question that I got to ask him that um, his response, I think, really shaped the majority of this paper. This was like, this was really like immersive as well for, for all of us. I almost felt like a journalist because I was like covering a topic that no one else had like looked at before. We got to talk to Rob Miles and ask also the tweets. We got to ask the um, actors, because like usually if you were to watch a movie or something like you did with our um, last play, you wouldn't be able to ask the, ask, ask the actors questions. So students started connecting with the cast and crew on Twitter, like Fiona, who was writing about Taming of the Shrew. I will be master of what is mine own. She is my Fiona goodness. hates that play. I thought it was a bit ironic that I'm going over this play today because it's actually International Women's Day. So, whoopee. <laughs> Asking if the play has any place in the 21st century, Fiona drew upon the scholarly introduction from Deborah Ann Bird and her understated gloss. Surely this play provokes much conversation. At our Q&A, Fiona asked Rob and if any of the cast and crew were hesitant to participate in the Taming of the Shrew, given its themes of sexism and domestication. I wanted to make sure that they had agency over the roles because the last thing that I would want as a director is for someone to say, this director made me do this <laughs> uh, and made me go through this as Katerina. Um, and that, that oh God, it's giving me shivers just thinking about it. Um, and so because of that, what was interesting was that both of them had a gentler interpretation of both characters than maybe I had seen, or maybe I might have advocated for had I not consciously- On Twitter, Fiona put that same question to the cast and crew. Sally McLean said she jumped at the chance to play Kate. She's a complex character and the challenge of inhabiting her through performance was fascinating to me. Sally then offered to send Fiona something she'd written about the part, the Why Shakespeare students joining the TSM Joe community and vice versa. I then heard a story from Emily Ingram, our master of props, I'd never heard before. She told Fiona she was pretty keen to get involved in TSM Joe from the outset, but hesitated partly due to scheduling, partly because I told myself, wait and check out how this group deal with Shroom first. Apparently, we passed the test. <laughs> so part of Fiona's thinking was about how the design for TSM Joe, working chronologically through Shakespeare's plays, required Taming of the Shrew very early in the series, but that's such a fraught play and 
It was really risky to do it as the second play in the series. So she grew more and more interested in the contextualizing apparatus of TSMGO, the scholarly introduction, the live chat box, the talk back after the performance. Especially after reading some of the comments and live reactions in the show must go online interpretation, I didn't feel like it was right to have a strictly negative conclusion where I just completely condemned the play. Ultimately, Fiona wrote an essay about the importance of curating inclusive interpretive spaces dealing with problematic texts. The show must go online's format, which promoted both the audience's interpretive freedom and actor and actress's performative freedom, particularly within the context of the Taming of the Shrew, supports a core postulation. Interpretive spaces matter. They can contribute to more ethical ways of engaging with works centered on difficult themes, in many cases adding more value to these works by encouraging novel interpretations. Lucas asked about staging my favorite play, Richard III, in the year 2020. Well, first of all, it, the, the very curious decision of protagonist actor uh, Ashley Bian to humanize Richard in the second half, uh, rather than draw the very uh, almost obvious and salient analogy that would, would, that would have connected Richard III and Trump. I shall despair. There is no creature loves me. To make that sort of almost obvious Trump analogy would be not at all really fun for any of the audience members, considering uh, how recent a phenomenon Trump Trumpism is. And also it's it, it's like it's it's like making a making a joke about a certain uh, event that might have just sort of dangerous connotations for us when it's, it's too soon after it's happened. So uh, instead of doing that, they, they chose the opposite route, uh, which is to humanize Richard. And I think that um, it's important because it keeps us on the edge of our seats. It keeps us wondering whether to want to punish Richard for his sins or whether to keep on sympathizing with his plight as he realizes the guilt of what he's done. Sam took on Love's Labour's Lost. Uh, and I compared um, sort of the teaching styles in the play um, and sort of talked about how those teaching styles uh, would translate to online learning. Oh, thou monster ignorance, how deformed dost thou look? <laughs> more likable characters are the ones who are using the more helpful tactics for online learning. Who will Samson love, my dear Martha? A woman, master. Of what complexion? Of the seawater green, sir. Green? Patrick became slightly obsessed with Rob's performance as Bottom. It was fascinating to see the dapper host of the show must go online <laughs> and transform into an absolutely bonkers comedic performance. You, Nick Bottom, are set down for Pyramus. Woo! What is Pyramus? I remember he, um, remember he told me about this, this email that he received <laughs> right after he did the performance. I was sent a very long, and I, and I will say a very angry email by uh, an old, uh, uh, hand, an old actor who wanted to e explain to me um, explicitly and in detail how wrong I, I had gotten the character of Bottom and how it was an abomination to uh, what Shakespeare had written and how I had misinterpreted all of the things that are there in the text. And I, and I offer that for balance because everyone is free to disagree. <laughs> and when people are interpreting Shakespeare's text, they will interpret it differently. And ultimately, that's valid. Whether you decide to like send a whole big email about it is a different question. So Patrick question. ended up arguing that Rob Miles' wildly inspired performance invites us to make a novel statement about A Midsummer Night's Dream. If the play has a protagonist, it must be bottom. Patrick then used that reading to theorize what a protagonist actually is, not necessarily the lead character or the hero. It's a, a lot about like audience participation, you know? like. Who, who's the one to remember? Yeah. 
Jonathan looked at Romeo and Juliet. And, and do ask Rob about how they pulled off the, the kiss in this scene here. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> when I read the text of the play, I didn't really feel uh, sympathy towards any of the characters. I thought they were all kind of uh, bad, uh, bad people. And um, I was just sort of observing instead of rooting for any of the characters. Um, but then when you look at, um, when you watch like a performance of it, there are things that they do uh, in order to make you feel uh, sympathetic uh, towards some characters. Um, so that, that I wrote about um, specifically how uh, camera work in the context of the show must go online. Therefore stay yet, thou needs not to be gone. Let me be taken, let me be put to death. Come death and welcome, Juliet Wilson. Bente looked at the camera work for the fight scenes in One Henry IV. Some of them were pre-recorded with two people on screen. And thus I win thee. Ah! Some of them felt like the actors were coming at us in the audience. It is the Prince of Wales that threatens thee, who never promiseth, but he means to pay. <laughs> Bent ended up arguing that the camera work in the Show Must Go Online's production of One Henry IV resembles television news strategies, creating a uniquely 21st century version of this 15th century history play. Karen argued that in As You Like It, Shakespeare challenged gender norms as much as he acceptably could within the story, but TSMGO's production reflects new understandings of gender and sexuality that emerge through the performance. The way that each production dealt with the question of gender and gender norms in society was that they each talked about them, but they talked about them in different ways. So Shakespeare, he kind of had um, who was gonna be performing his works already set in stone. I think what really sold it to me was um, a quote that Rob Miles gave. And I believe what I said was something to the effect of uh, in Shakespeare's time, uh, all actors were guys and actors played all the parts. And nowadays our actors are guys, gals and non-binary pals and our actors play all the parts, which informed our kind of broadly gender blind attitude to casting, but often a gender conscious uh, attitude to casting as well, uh, which we'll touch on more in a bit. So for Shakespeare, it was already decided that men were going to be acting. So he kind of had the plot and his storylines and character developments to say what he wanted to say about gender in his society. And for TSMGO, they kind of had the opposite where they had all the creative liberty with production and with cast. They already had their plot and their storyline set in stone. So they had another kind of playground to talk about these things. <laughs> what, boy? Come, come, elder brother. You are too young in this. Don't thou lay hands on me, villain? Sophia looked at gender in Twelfth Night. So she argued that in Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, gender reversals are used to create a plot in which the female characters are unable to maintain their authority. And by applying 21st century casting practices, TSMGO casts more women and regenders Feste as a woman, providing more authority to the female characters. However, in both cases, this only emphasizes the gender norms of the play and accentuates how the majority of the female characters are unable to obtain the new ideal that Feste in the show Must Go Online creates. When that I was and a little tiny boy with hey ho the wind and the rain 
a foolish thing, but was a toy for the rain, it raineth every day. On Twitter, Sophia connected with our Feste, Karis McQueen, who wrote an extensive note about how she felt Feste was one of the most intelligent characters in the play, so she could run circles around anyone in a battle of wits and have a laugh while doing so. Joe argued that the show must go online has a philosophy of inclusive casting that is kind of challenged by Othello, a play about racism and sexism. Come hither, Moore. I here do give thee that with all my heart, which but thou hast already, with all my heart I would keep from thee. For your sake, Jewel, I am glad at soul I have no other child, for thy escape would teach me tyranny to hang clogs on them. Uh, theater, historically, not very inclusive. Um, and then there's layer added with Shakespeare, how he wrote the play. Um, and what he envisioned in terms of race as a theme in, within the play. Um, and then you have the modern implications of like, I wrote this essay in, well, I suppose I wrote it in 2021, 20, but that was in light of um, a sort of racial reckoning uh, in, in 2020 that, that we saw uh, sort of on a societal level. Joe was able to connect with Alex Andlow, who played Desdemona, on Twitter. In a powerful essay, she wrote, In light of the continued misogyny experienced by women throughout the world, I feel it is important to maintain the need for gender-specific casting in the instance of Othello and Desdemona. What you see is you compare, you know, the casting in a play like Macbeth or a play like Hamlet, where I remember specifically that there was gender-blind, race-blind casting. Um, and then in Othello, uh, that freedom to, to do that is sort of taken away by the fact that race is a driving force uh, in that play. And special credit here goes to the notorious DSB, David Sterling Brown, for his help as a consultant on race conscious casting for this play, where he wanted to balance Othello's apparent singularity with our aspirations for inclusive casting in a creative way that still served the text. Sophia turned to King Lear. Blow winds and crack your cheek. Wait, blow. You cataracts and honey pickles. Out. You have drenched our steeples, drowned the cot. The show must go online, use their sort of unique visual opportunities on Zoom um, to highlight the process through which um, King Lear kind of comes to see himself more clearly and to recognize his limitations. Oh. 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 Stone. They had sort of been very minimalistic about trying to portray um, human interaction up to that point, given that it was over Zoom. And in that scene, they kind of went all for it and full force and had King Lear um, kind of holding an object with a cloak over it that looked like Cordelia from the back. And Arba looked at Macbeth. I argued that both Macbeth and Shakespeare's Macbeth and the show must go online, it's Macbeth. Show tell us that gender tonality. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thought, unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the tall top full of direst cruelty. On one hand, Shakespeare suggests to a society that believes that gender and personality are intrinsically linked, that this is not the case by portraying characters such as Macbeth, Lady Macbeth, and the Weird Sisters who do not conform to gender norms. On the other hand, the show must go online asserts this notion through its cast of all women and non-binary people depicting a reality not shaped by the gender of the characters. The Prince of Cumberland. That is a step on which I must fall down or else owe a leap. 
Albert argued that whereas many of Shakespeare's more popular plays are highly visual, All's Well That Ends Well is a linguistic text that relies on character dialogue and wordplay more than visuals and actions, and that quality leads itself well to the parameters of Zoom performance. You have some stain of soldier in you. Let me ask you a question. Man is enemy to virginity. How may we barricade it against him? Aria looked at Antony and Cleopatra. It's one of the very few Shakespearean plays that centers a non-European woman as one of the main characters. So what first caught our attention was these time-lapse establishing shots and some snappy editing between scenes. After watching your staging of Antony and Cleopatra, I kind of felt like it evoked more of a filmic style um, than a traditional theatrical style. Your commission's ready. Follow me and receive it. Trouble yourselves no further. Pray you hasten your generals after. Sir, Mark Antony will end but kiss Octavia and will follow. Till I see you in your soldier's dress, which will become you both. Farewell. Give me some music. Usually, I would read out the stage directions. Now, this was the problem that led us to, to that solution. And that was, I am a white man, and the show was an all global majority cast. It really surprised me, surprised me when he said that, um, he said that as like a white Englishman, I knew that I needed to sort of minimize my voice or like decentralize my voice in the storytelling. And I was like, wow, okay, that, that itself is just something I don't think William Shakespeare would have said. My paper start, like kind of ended up being um, a comparison um, from the lens of the storytellers and sort of um, comparing the show must go online's rendition of the story with the Shakespearean text um, by looking at Rob Miles as the director versus Shakespeare as the main storyteller. We, you know, we don't have photos from the ancient world. Our imagination of it is shaped by the media we consume. And so as performers, as theater creators, it falls to us to help create that imagery, that imagination so people can see we've always been here. We, people of all stripes, nationalities, ethnicities, races, we've always been in this world. And so it's a great honor to be able to bring that image to the imagination and to show it, it wasn't just the whitewashed world you might've seen in old movies. And I think um, something that we can probably all attest to as actors is that there's the perception of inaccessibility for actors of color and especially when it comes to Shakespeare. And so often the roles that were supposed to be for people of color were often played by white men in blackface, uh, Othello. So <laughs> having this opportunity to take space and demand attention is so important. And it shows all actors that no matter the color of your skin, where you come from in the world, your accent or whatever, you have a place within Shakespeare. You have a place within these words and these words have the, the space to belong to you. With Cymbeline, Sarah thought about the date of the performance, November 4th, 2020, after a historic election in the United States, but before the results were known, and how the chat feature provided community, even as the show brought escapism. There's a lot going on in the world this week, much of it fraught and difficult. Sarah argued that the show must go online's November 4th staging of Cymbeline contains three generations of empire. First, there's the British, uh, uh, the rather, sorry, the Roman Empire, which once contained the British Empire or Britain. There's the British Empire, which once contained America and the American Empire at a crucial point in its relationship with nationalism. Wonderful. Apologies, I'm taking a second to just acknowledge that in the chat. <laughs> So, what did David Martinez have to say? David Martinez had a fascinating thing to say. Her essay uh, sparked a conversation among the cast and crew, uh, and David Martinez said that the tension and anxiety definitely made for heightened sensation. It allowed for me to feel uh, that moment as Gadarius, as a revolution even more. I felt like we were finally shouting for change in warlike fashion. 
Kevin V. Smith, who uh, you might have seen earlier as the Queen, said the election and the performance were completely intertwined. There was so much anxiety and fear for me in playing this role. I described it as climbing my personal Mount Everest. The night before, I told my friend, win or lose, I'll be getting into drag tomorrow. Smith also wrote uh, that uh, to us before we even started expressing uh, anxieties and what would happen if Trump won uh, and needing just kind of explaining to us really what um, their needs would be uh, in order to be able to perform on November the 4th at all. Uh, our Pisanio, Misha McCullough, said it was really about being sensitive and responsive to castmates in rehearsal through such a stressful time. And I do stress that this was an ensemble effort, uh, especially from our international community, to kind of create and hold space uh, for our American actors. Uh, case in point, Steph Cunyola, our Alvar Argus, uh, had been online checking every outlet possible for every minute leading up to and immediately after the show. But... During the show, all tabs and devices besides Zoom and Word were off and muted, and that, that silence was actually so powerful. Our scholar for that show, Sawyer Kemp, said the election was definitely on my mind right in the intro, but votes were still being counted as the production was live. When I saw Biden pull ahead, I wrote down Pisanio's line, fortune brings in some boats that are not steered. Ali wrote on The Winter's Tale. Kind of important to my essay was that is written the first half, it is a tragedy in the second half, is written in a pastoral mode, so it's more of a comedy. Um, so my overall argument ended up being that in the Show Must Go On's uh, production of it, they use like different setups of zoom, zoom screens and different lighting to portray these two different worlds. So the first half they use kind of darker lighting and darker like tragic zoom screens. Honey Gabriel, our Paulina, told Ali this felt like two plays in one and that Cecilia and Bohemia should feel like really different places. I created the dark Sicilian atmosphere in my bedroom, so I turned off the lights, pulled the curtains and used the brightness of my laptop screen to illuminate my face. The queen, the queen, the sweet, fierce creatures dead and vengeance fought not drop down yet. Elizabeth Dennehy, who played Camillo, uh, and you should definitely check this out uh, for Camillo's moustache in the second half alone. Uh, Cecilia was intensely close up, cold, only lit from the computer. Bohemia was a vastness, sunlit, clean. I was in the same room and felt like I was in two totally different worlds. Come on and bid us welcome to your sheep shearing as your good flock shall prosper. Ali argued that the different genres and lighting practices allow us to theorize different genres of Zoom setups that we use in our daily lives. At the end, I was giving, I kind of gave examples of different Zoom genres and I was talking about how like a more tragic one would be like in a dark room at 9 a.m. for our Xbox class maybe with like just your laptop lighting your face, whereas you kind of give a very different vibe if you're outside with like all that stuff. So I think it's changed maybe not how I did it personally but how I saw like other students I think I paid more attention to how other students set up their zoom screens and like teachers for example just how they portrayed themselves. Josh argued that whereas Shakespeare and Fletcher's Henry VIII or All is True was about constructing the mythology of this Tudor king TSM Joe's performance was about deconstructing that mythology. Probably an hour in total of that production was dedicated to that historical analysis of how this was treated that time and how we did it differently now. That was truthful in the sense that it came from the actual documents. And then obviously there was a bit of propaganda thrown in there for good measure. So maybe not all is true, is it? <laughs> so Shakespeare included elaborate displays of wealth, now also carefully crafted character dynamics in Henry VIII in order to preserve the most redeeming and sympathetic qualities of Henry's reign. Then nearly half a millennium later, the show must go online. They were able to reimagine Shakespeare's generally favorable portrayal of Henry. Uh, and also they effectively deconstructed it into a more informed and objective narrative around it, the whole Tudor dynasty. Justin's essay about Janet Guest's BSL performance and Miriam Grace's Pericles launched a conversation about how theater makers are never done working to make art, thought, and conversation more accessible for more people. To sing a song 
that old was sung. From ashes, ancient Gower is come, assuming man's infirmities. It hath been sung at festivals, on ember eaves and holy ales, and lords and ladies in their lives have read it for restoratives. Mariam Grace told Justin she always knew I wanted to have the production signed. I think it's a lovely addition to any show and a way that those fluent and non-fluent in sign language can have a shared experience whilst watching a show. I think this last one in particular speaks to the fact that inclusion is a journey that's never finished and that innovation itself is a process without an end. And yet we saw in a recent announcement that the show must go online despite being in just the nascent stages of creating digital theater is to go on a hiatus after 18 months of constant creativity. That's right. We've done all we could within the constraints that we had for as long as we could with the energy we could give. But that has now sadly caught up to us. This is not the end. Rather, we are going to enter a chrysalis to consider how TSMGO, digital theatre and inclusive global Shakespeare might evolve, opening new horizons and approaches while ensuring the work is appropriately resourced and sustainable if it is to continue. This is a daunting challenge and we may not succeed, but TSM Joe was founded on optimism in the face of adversity and that will never change. So this, this reminds me of the day of our Q and A in our Why Shakespeare class was actually the due date of the first child of Rob and Sarah, TSMGO's producer. I half expected Rob to be in the middle of a point about Love's Labor's Lost and turn around and run out the door. But I think for me, the, the, the reminder there is that it's pretty cool that the show must go online is the second most important thing that Rob and Sarah created during their pandemic year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Jeffrey. But look at what these students have created from it too. I've been completely awestruck by their insights. And it's even wilder to think that these incredible explorations of the material have come from one instance of teaching TSMGO. And luckily, we're very humbled to be in receipt of several others. Gemma Allred, big ups to Gemma in the chat, whoop whoop. Uh, Gemma has put TSMGO into the context of other lockdown and digital theatre productions. Uh, we also have a wonderful contribution from Stephanie Sherilyn, who has designed an entire course about digital theatre during lockdown and has shared with us three different assignments. Erin uh, Sullivan has focused on Shakespeare in society and multimedia adaptations of a Romeo and Juliet. Uh, these demonstrate just some of the many ways in which you can make use of this body of material now available to be explored whenever you and your students are ready, courtesy of the brand new launch right now education page on the show must go online's website so drop everything you're doing stop listening to me and head on over to robmiles.co.uk forward slash t-s-m-g-o-e-d-u that's robmiles.co.uk forward slash t-s-m-g-o-e-d-u so in addition to our talk today and our q a with the why shakespeare class You'll find some sample syllabi, some sample uh, assignments that teachers can use to teach digital theater, some sample essays from students, handouts to help your students study TSMGO and other digital theater. We are extremely grateful and honored to be featuring materials from some of the leading scholars who have been studying Shakespeare during the pandemic. Absolutely, and we're eager to continue building our offerings and our resources on this site. So we invite you to send along any materials that you may have been uh, developing if you have taught TSMGO already, or indeed, if you end up developing a response to today's plenary or plenary, I'm never sure, uh, <laughs> uh, then please do get in touch uh, with those details and we'll be happy to share them with the wider community. So our hope is that these resources can help teachers and students join the TSMGO community, create their own stories and continue cultivating inclusive interpretive spaces. Thank you. Thank you so much. And with that, I think we are opening up now to questions. Yes, we absolutely are. First, can I just say a huge, huge thank you to both Jeff and Rob and all of your students as well, because the way that the, the work of the students was was foregrounded and the, the insights that they gave and the way that they engaged with those, those productions and those plays, you know, some of the plays in which, you know, there's 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 ones that we kind of feel like we all know, but all things like, you know, all's well that ends well and all that kind of thing is the way that they kind of found new ways of interpreting those plays was was absolutely 
just phenomenal and 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 thank you as well for the the huge amount of kind of video into sort of live conversation i felt like that was the truly truly the most hybrid virtual comes to real life but it's on zoom and it was just fantastic thank you so so much um we are open to questions i'm just keeping an eye on the uh, the the chat to see if any questions have come through i i definitely have questions so i may take the chair's prerogative and um and and go for a question of my own. Um, we've obviously seen the, the educational side of the sort of, not the educational afterlife, I suppose, it's just the educational life of the show must go online because it was always set up as something that was, was meant to be, you know, creating an educational resource. I know that that was something that was very kind of close to your heart, Rob, when you started it off. Um, I wondered if you could give a little bit of insight into um, some of the product, you know, the, the way in which you create, because you created a Shakespeare production a week for 36 weeks during a pandemic and it would just be easy because I know this I mean I I obviously as you know I've obviously done quite a lot of work to do with Shamus Go Online um, with a few others you know Erin Sullivan, Gemma Allred, Andrea Smith is in the chat I know is, is a, a, a digital groundling as well um, so I was wondering if you could you could just give a little bit of insight to people who may not have seen a huge amount of Shamus Go Online into the product the process of putting together um, a Zoom production of a, a Shakespeare play in a week. Um, uh, yes, absolutely. I'll be very happy to do so. I do want to just take a quick beat and a quick pause to address a couple of things. First, uh, Gemma has credited me as a master of Zoom multitasking. Now, that might be true, but it is not relevant in this case because all of the heavy lifting, all of the hard work has been done by Jeffrey in this instance. And I have been absolutely bowled over and awestruck and humbled by the uh, detail and the intricacy with which he's composed this incredible narrative no, no, today's no. Uh, Rob, let me jump in here real quickly. Just <laughs> Just to know, imagine what it's like to prepare a joint presentation with someone who may be the world's leading expert on how to manage a Zoom meeting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope it wasn't too intimidating, Jeffrey. I think you've done an incredible job. Uh, and then second, I just want to throw out some some uh, gratitude, really, um, to yourself, Ben, to Gemma uh, as well, uh, to Andrea, um, uh, to Erin and all of our uh, contributors for the new uh, EDU website as well. Um, it's It's been unbelievable the the level of enthusiasm and the detail of the responses uh, i know gemma's got an amazing article out there about the macbeth that was touched upon uh, here and the role uh, that gender played in kind of interpreting that production as an audience member which i think is well worth checking out gemma took a link in the chat um but uh, it, i just want to uh, you know I, I don't get often an opportunity to speak to you so i'm just going to take this one to publicly say uh, how grateful I am to you guys for your continued support and kind of championing of the whole TSM Joe project. It really, really does mean so much to all of us, not just me. Um, show in a week. Right. So this evolved over time, obviously. The first one was just, ah, let's open a Zoom room and just leave it open 24-7 and people can just jump in and read their scenes and get ready and go. Uh, and every week we would just add something new so the very first one um you know fortunately for us shakespeare's plays um although the curve was quite steep there is still a curve of ambition where like the most ambitious thing that happens in uh two gentlemen of verona was um a, a disguise uh this guy kind of like a, a you know a, a, a kind of gulling scene uh light uh, and a letter pass and those are both eminently achievable things and a dog of course which became a running theme because uh, the the groundlings absolutely loved the dog uh, which was another thing that we always did because we had the live chat we could always tell what the audience was seeing and responding to and would like to see more of and we tried to make sure that we kind of threaded that through into future plays as well so um uh, the uh, team of the truth famously opens with a hunting scene with a pack of dogs so we went dog crazy the following week because you've got to give the audience what do they want so uh that was kind of a part of it was listening and responding and building a week on week on what we did um the uh schedule kind of evolved in three parts it started as just an open call where i would be in the room and i would work with anybody on whatever they wanted to work with we then evolved that into track runs uh, where we would have the principal characters do their scenes linearly and everyone else would just kind of jump in and fill out um their spaces there as well and we work on scenes in that way but again very ad hoc because we were always really conscious of um exploitation essentially uh, so we wanted to make sure that we weren't asking too much of our actors that we weren't defining uh, how they were going to spend their time too much if they were going to be involved in this we were very conscious that people were giving us a gift of energy and investment uh, in putting the show together however 
when we floated the idea of a rehearsal schedule, it was overwhelmingly popular and people were like, actually, we'd really like to be able to spend more time on this, actually. So uh, then it kind of graduated to being about two and a half days uh, of rehearsal across uh, afternoons and evenings, UK time, so that our Americans, uh, like Jeff, weren't getting up at six in the morning every morning <laughs> to be able to do their lines. Um, and we would work at a, pay a, a rate of about eight pages an hour. Um, if you've ever been on a film set, it is astonishing if you can get through one page in a day. Um, so that kind of gives you an accordion of time that we're working with. We would generally get an opportunity to run scenes twice. Uh, I would give two rounds of notes and the second round of notes would just want you to take away and work on in your own time. Um, we would have a day uh, or a, a kind of a set session, which was the set piece session. So every play has something kind of crazy ambitious in it that we wanted to try and achieve. And whether that's camera movement or special effects or uh, whatever it might be, soundscaping, um, we would get everybody involved in that scene together for a dedicated session to hash out that kind of complex blocking uh, or that um, kind of interactivity that we were trying to achieve um, so that they had as much notice as possible through the rehearsal period to kind of run that and get that into the body. Um, um, and then it was just a matter of we never did, we never did a dress rehearsal. We did a tech the day before, so we would just run all the cues so that the actors had heard them. So they were kind of going, "Ah, oh, Christ, what was that uh, in Macbeth or something like that?" When something spooky happens, um, uh, and then we would run the show for the first time in its entirety live in front of the audience, uh, which was nail biting, uh, but also had this phenomenally uh, kind of compressive and sharpening effect. Um, and I think uh, it, it kind of has parallels, I know Ben Crystal's raised this before, of um, original practice, right, original process. Um, shows were raised in very short periods of time with very minimal rehearsal. Um, and that's kind of what we were doing, really. So that gives you a broad overview of what would happen. Uh, the show would go up on Wednesday. We'd then read and edit the, ne the next play on the Thursday. Uh, we would do a, an R&D with our creative team on the Friday while we're simultaneously casting the show. We would have a welcome meeting with the cast on the Saturday and then we'll start rehearsals on the Sunday again. So it was 24-7 rotation. It was pretty, pretty wild, but uh, that's how it was done. <laughs> Uh, it's fantastic and thank you yeah it's an absolutely phenomenal achievement and you know and, and the resource that's come out of it and the, the community that's come out of it is is absolutely brilliant um i'm going to go to a couple of questions in the chat i'm actually going to go to andrew's question first because it kind of leads quite nicely on from what you were just talking about in terms of the text and working with the text so andrew says how did you go about editing the texts for performance were you more cautious at the beginning and she said i'm particularly thinking about the references to rosalind in love's labor's loss being black that were cut uh, oh interesting okay yeah so uh, yes, we, we, so we had guidelines that again evolved over time. Um, I believe we kept some references in to Rosalind being uh, darker, darker skinned um, because I remember Ben uh, Galpin, who was playing um, uh, Barone, had uh, this idea that actually it would be good for uh, Barone to challenge them on this attitude that they had. So I think, I think we kept some of it, uh, but then we got rid of some of the kind of worse examples of it, I think. So, so it's addressed, but it's not... I guess exploitative. What we don't want to do ever is kind of trigger people unnecessarily. So we try and look at whether these challenging um, thoughts are in service of a theme of the play. And if they are, then they absolutely stay. So if there's intentional racism or uh, kind of plot based racism, um, or troubling themes, all of that stuff stays because that is part of doing the shows. If there's what you would call, uh, and I, I kind of feel bad saying this, but kind of casual racism or kind of just an ingrained racism um, that isn't serving a theme in the play, it's just hurtful, then we would try to ameliorate that, edit it out or uh, adjust it. So um, the, the very first clip that we showed uh, has Lance from Two Gentlemen of Verona. He says something about, oh, and if he doesn't agree with that, he's a Jew or something like that. So we, we got rid of that. And he says, if he doesn't agree with that, he's a Burke, because it's kind of following the dramatic intention of what I guess the character was trying to say at the time uh, without necessarily just, just um, punching down, I suppose. Um, and we, we did try and avoid that. Uh, but as we got further in and all of the uh, kind of plays got more <laughs> knotty and complex and, and thematically racist in that way uh, we found that we did need to um, uh, kind of keep that stuff in and really address it and make it part of the show um, so Merchant of Venice 
Um, Tiffany, who plays Portia, has a line, uh, and Tiffany is a, a mixed race actor, has a line about the Prince of Morocco being dark skinned, uh, and her uh, handmaid uh, is played by um, a black actor uh, who uh, then kind of shoots a real pointed look and you see that register and uh, she changes her attitude in response to being challenged on it. So that's that's an example of where we've kept it in, but through the performance without necessarily changing the text, we, we've kind of addressed it, I suppose, in a different way. Um, Midsummer Night's Dream is another one where uh, there's uh, racist language, um, which is used um, in, in a problematic way. And that was the show where we uh, addressed Black Lives Matter. Um, because it had happened just a week before and for that reason because everything was so raw and because we wanted the play to be a comedy and to really kind of have that um, lifting and escapist effect we uh, chose to uh, elide over that in that case so it was definitely done on a case-by-case -case basis um, we had a lot of editorial guidelines so we would make sure that um, women's parts were not cut to the greatest extent possible um, to try and uh, equalize the plays to the extent that we could um, we tried to make sure that, um, I'm just trying to cast my mind back to what they all were now. There's a big list, uh, <laughs> but we tried to make sure that we could get it down to um, about, what would it be? Um, two and a half hours max, essentially, was, was, the, was what we wanted. Uh, we would never cut whole scenes and we would never cut whole characters unless they seemed to serve no functional purpose um, it, because we wanted to give people a complete experience of the play. And that, again, ties into that idea of using it as an educational resource. I think that's also why we weren't frequently bolder in our interpretive choices in, from a directorial standpoint was because we wanted to give people the play um, so that then, again, that interpretive space is open for the performers and the audiences uh, and students and everybody else. No, great. That's a really comprehensive answer and fantastic, fantastic insight into the way in which you worked with the text and also didn't just allow the text to, to you know, there's, there's a sense with completeness is it, well, we just need to leave the text down because it's almost you're setting it on a pedestal I suppose but actually mm -hmm. you know there's there's if there's no need to do something if it's not like you say if it's not serving a purpose or you're not using it in a way that is is for some kind of benefit or something that's positive then why keep it you know absolutely um, yeah and, and I think just on the point of pedestals we are definitely anti-pedestal at the show must go online which may seem weird given that we've done all of the place <laughs> uh, I guess that infers a pedestal but genuinely we were not precious about mm. the, these works in that way yeah absolutely um, I wonder if I could just lead before I go, I'm going to go back to the chat questions because there are chat questions coming in, but I just wanted to ask um, Jeff, just kind of following on from that, what your, we saw some of the, the questions, I'm uh, sorry, the reactions that your students had um, in, the, in the talk that you gave, were there any reactions that particularly surprised you or um, the, you know, the way in which students reacted to some of those slightly more um, potentially problematic elements? Um, yeah, I, I suppose uh, a couple things. First of all, Rob just mentioned they weren't um, precious about the plays, but also they weren't precious about themselves. I, I know as we were kind of putting our talk together, Rob was very keen if there were any moments where one of the students was critical, perhaps, of something the show must go online. He was very open and, and inviting of let's get that in here because, you know, that's that's part of the conversation. I think, for, I mean, the students are amazing and, and, you know, all we need to do is just sort of give them license to, to interpret the world and they can take it and, and go with it. For me, the most problematic aspect about it was just asking students to sit in front of a screen and do more Zoom during a, a, a remote learning class. Um, you know, as, as we're all kind of thinking now about what the future of digital theater might be, I think we're, we're able to see some of the real affordances and some of the real values. I, I think especially for me, um, for folks who are in New York or London and having access to amazing theater, high quality theater, digital theater is such a revolution. Um, but, you know, uh, many of us are, are theater people and, and you know that live presence matters. And, and so we can start to think about kind of some of the, the different ways that these two different venues have uh, different virtues and um, some liabilities and, and shortcomings. Um, but yeah, the, the, the students, you know, as, as soon as they get um, a, a little bit of um, freedom, encouragement to, to talk about the things that they're talking about with their friends, but they're always a little uncertain, should I bring this into my class? As, as soon as they're kind of given that license, then they're amazing and they're off. Mm. No, brilliant, thank you. And yeah, it's just, 
just the reactions like I said I've already said but the reactions that your students gave some some of the insights are just absolutely inspirational so and that's testament to to you kind of really engaging with show must go online as well and 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 giving them that resort you know using that resource in the way that it's intended to be used and 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 really showing the, the value of doing that um I'm going to combine two questions and pose them to both of you I think they were posed just to Rob but I think it, both of you can probably answer in a slightly different way um so uh Lauren asked which show must go online production or productions did you enjoy putting on the most and I suppose for Jeff it would be which would be your favorite to, to have engaged with in whatever way but equally Lydia said opposite question to Lauren's uh global pandemic can be pretty bleak so were there any plays you really didn't look forward to putting on or any that felt too bleak or depressing in the performance so I guess which ones did you really enjoy and which ones were maybe the ones you're thinking oh god we've got to do this one in the middle of lockdown or whatever brutal yeah brutal <laughs> questions um I'm, I'm gonna give imperfect answers so I'm gonna I'm gonna flag that now um I I, I have a shortcut to the worst uh, which was Merchant of Venice because it's an appalling play <laughs> um I, in terms of the problems that it raises um i i do think that we should still engage with it that we should interrogate it um that it has a place because as long as there are things like anti-semitism which in the uk has been like, singled out as a, as a real problem um we we need to be using our drama to to explore that um it doesn't mean that you want to or that it's easy um and uh, we had a situation where the original dramatic intention uh, our kind of byline or my, my philosophy was try and follow Shakespeare, what seems to be shakespeare's dramatic intention through the play and it seemed like his intention was for the audience to root for portia so we had a version of the play originally where uh, portia um in the court scene was proving how broken the legal system is and that law actually doesn't equate to justice and doesn't equate to morality and by flipping the law on its head and giving the reverse verdict 10 lines after the previous verdict kind of sent the whole place into uproar and uh, this kind of outsider this mixed race outsider could come into this um, racist space and prove that it's racist and blow it up and it kind of might drop and walk away we tried it it didn't work because the lines and the, and, the, and, the, and the true intention of the text is so inescapable um, that you can't get around it. And we go into detail in this in the post-show chat on Merchant of Venice if you want to deep dive with, with the actors as well. So it's good to get their voices on it. Um, but I would say that was a very painful production to do. And it was and especially in such a condensed amount of time. We stayed up till 1.30 in the morning GMT uh, trying to crack this and, and reformatting it from the ground up. Um, so that, that was horrible. But... Even though it's painful, it was growing pains. And I know that I grew as a result of it. I know that the participants felt that they were enriched by the process of going through it. So just because something is um, uh, painful or ugly does not necessarily mean that it doesn't have worth. So I don't want to say, oh, I, ha I hate it. I wish we had never done it. Not, not that at all, but it was definitely the hardest, the worst one to do in a pandemic. Horrible. Um, and then best, I mean, best is really hard. I think we hit a couple of really strong runs um, where we had, uh, obviously, the famous ones. So you've got, like, I think it's Romeo and Juliet, Much Ado, Hamlet, uh, are all kind of tied closely together as you like it. And that was just a really fun time because they're the ones that the actors are most confident with a lot of the time as well. So you can push them further in less time. Uh, and then we got a really great run towards the end where we were just kind of locking into and exploiting every corner of what we could do uh, with Zoom and in the time with um, Winter's Tale, Cymbeline, Tempest, uh, you know, and, and obviously, <laughs> mercifully for me, we were near the end, so it was such a relief. Um, so I, I would say that that's my kind of broad answer to that question. Uh, Jeffrey. Yeah, uh, quickly, I, I think the student papers, I, I loved all of these. I, I These papers were, without a doubt, the best batch of student papers I've, I've gotten during my time teaching. And um, it, it was nerve wracking going in because we had 19 different students writing about 19 different plays, which meant I was really nervous about, are we going to be able to have conversations if everyone's reading a different play? Um, but again, they, they took such ownership of each one of the play and they kind of became the expert on it and became the representative and we were able to toss to, to students and uh, they would narrate the, as their play related to our classroom conversation. Um, the ones that stuck out to me the most that, that remain with me the most I think are probably uh, maybe Sam's essay about Love's Labor's Lost and Ali's essay about the Winter's Tale because they share a feature where both of those developed 
uh, really good readings of these plays, but then they sort of theorized outward and helped us understand kind of pandemic life. So Sam's was about different strategies of remote teaching, which is something that a lot of us have been thinking about and about how there are didactic characters in Love's Labor's Lost and there are teachers uh, who take a more conversational approach in Love's Labor's Lost. And one of those is better suited to online learning. That was definitely a case where I was learning from Sam, how should I teach my class? Um, with Ali's about the genres of Zoom setups, it's just such a perfect idea that we are all now so intimately familiar with about how we see different ways of which we present ourselves, different, we see different ways other people present themselves on Zoom and we can think about comic and, and tragic and pastoral and romantic Zoom setups that, that we can use the terms of literary studies such as genre to interpret life. Those are the moments for me where kind of everything really clicked. Um, the essays that, not, not essays that I, I didn't look forward to, but the ones that gave me the, the um, some, some nerves were the ones, uh, Fiona's dealing with Taming of the Shrew, Joe's dealing with Othello's, where we're getting into these really difficult um, issues related to identity. And especially with, with Fiona's, where we saw a little bit how she, you know, I, I didn't want to, um, as her thinking became more and more nuanced and, and she started thinking about how she dislikes this play, but she kind of likes what TSMGO did with the play. I, I didn't want to feel like she, she had to sort of sanitize her initial disregard for the, the play or, or resistance to the play as she developed this really nuanced thinking. And so we talked a lot about how she had had liberty, you know, um, that, that these plays aren't on a pedestal as, as Rob said, that sometimes those, um, uh, you know, kind of resistant or, or speaking back to Shakespeare style essays are, are some of the most powerful. And then she was even, even able to take it a, a step beyond that of developing this really nuanced way of thinking about how problematic texts can come into these inclusive interpretive spaces like the show must go online. Just, a, you know, I mean, amazing ideas, amazing ideas. Um, and, and one thing I, I will notice we're kind of, uh, thinking here is, is with respect to those conversational, you know, uh, moments that we see in Love's Labor is Lost, uh, absolutely, please do share in the chat or, or share in conversation. If you've got any stories from your classes about teaching digital theater, successes, failures, uh, I think everyone would, would love to hear those and, and benefit from those. But over to you, Ben. <laughs> No, fantastic. Thank you. Um, and yeah, please do, because I know there are people who have taught or engaged with, with these uh, these things and, and that resource that you've launched and launched at Brickgrad, which is, you know, fantastic. Um, and hopefully that will kind of continue to grow. And I'm sure, you know, it will become that a, an additional resource alongside the resource that's already been created. Um, I can see Larissa has got her hand up, so I'm going to invite her if she would like to, to turn her camera on and ask her question herself, if she is if she is hello available. i'm not going to turn you. my camera on okay um Do it like a radio <laughs> phone <moment>. then. <laughs> i'm taking a screen break um but i will ask it out loud <laughs> um thank you again rob and jeff for such a fascinating presentation i absolutely loved it and have been looking forward to it and definitely lived up to expectations so thank you um exceeded them i should say um but my question is for jeff well, I have kind of two questions. The first one's really short. I'm just curious, um, apologies if you covered this already, but ha have you taught the Why Shakespeare class like pre-pandemic, the show must go on? Okay. Yeah, it's a, uh, so just very quickly on, on that one, then I'll, I'll uh, hand it back over. It's a, a course I've taught for eight years and I've been able to kind of develop. And, and the only way I've been able to teach the same course for eight years is developing assignments where we can bring in different texts or even different series, such as the show must go online. So that keeps things fresh and that keeps things alive. And um, yeah, and, and, and sort of have, have developed the superstructure to give to students the opportunity to write these really kind of high level, amazing essays. Awesome, thank you. Um, that's good because my my second question goes off of that. And you touched on this a bit in the last question, but I was just wondering what other kind of like new insights came up um, from your students during this round of teaching the class. And if there were particular like topics and themes of interest that you felt kind of came up a lot through this experience of teaching through the show must go on online, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, um, for me, one of the biggest takeaways, the biggest discoveries was that 
uh, first year college students love the obscure plays, the ones they've never heard about before, the all's well that ends well, you know, Albert getting into that play and he became an expert on that play. And, and I was, you know, a little bit hesitant because, you know, I'm, we're not gonna be talking about the content of that play in class. Is a student gonna be able to, to navigate some of that really difficult linguistic material really well? Same thing with Love's Labor's Loss. But they, they love the challenge of doing that. They, they sort of, you know, take ownership of it and get excited about that. And so for me, I think in the future, one of the, the things that I'll, I'll take away from this experience was being a, um, a lot more eager to bring in plays that students, you know, that, that aren't in the, the, the larger cultural Shakespeare conversation as much um, and, and getting students to, um, you know, engage with some of those materials a bit. Excellent, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. And thank you for, for your question, um, Larissa. Um, I'm going to sort of tie together something that you've said, Rob, with a question that's come slightly before it. So you talked about, you, you've mentioned the digital groundlings, and I guess just to sort of give, give a, um, a little bit of context, I'll let you explain a bit more, but the digital groundlings are essentially the sort of week by week um, viewers who, who tuned in most, most Wednesdays um, throughout the, the lockdown last year. Um, and Gemma said, could you talk um, a little bit more about the chat as a playing space as well. So I guess it's sort of a two part thing. So just something about that sense of community was created, but also how you use the chat uh, yep. at times as a playing space. Um, Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, on that, uh, in Midsummer Night's Dream, we had uh, the lovers and uh, Theseus and Hippolytus interjections in the play within a play uh, put in as chat reactions to the show. Um, so they would they would say them uh, f with their cameras off, um, just the kind of audio only uh, from off, off stage as it were, but they were also posted in the chat. And um, we had Rosencrantz and Guildenstern when they were searching for Hamlet, uh, went searching in the chat and asked if anybody had seen him. Uh, so there's a kind of a, a number of opportunities there. We had uh, a poll that we ran in the chat uh, for much ado about nothing about what punishment Don Pedro should receive. Uh, it was determined that it should be a custard pie in the face. So the actor, uh, uh, very, very bravely got a paper plate and some shaving cream and then tied their own hands behind their back and headbutted it at the end of the show, uh, which is amazing. And had all thing, all options on deck as well. Um, so some of them were less kind than others. So I think she was pretty pleased with the one that, that came up. Um, so yeah, we did, we did try and use the chat as a kind of, uh, as a performance venue as much as anything. Um, when I do Shakespeare in real life, um, Hopefully that'll happen again at some point. Uh, but I love getting up and amongst the audience. I love getting um, uh, the actors to be in that space because again, thinking about it from an original practice perspective, it was a shared light experience. The audience uh, could be seen and were frequently acknowledged by uh, the actors. There was no fourth wall. Uh, and so we were trying to break down that fourth wall as much as we could uh, through our use of the chat. So yeah, it was definitely something that we uh, that we took pride in and, and used uh, as, as often as possible. Similarly, social media. Um, so in our production of Coriolanus, uh, which again, in, in terms of more obscure plays, the politics in that like blew my mind when I uh, kind of re-addressed re it for this show it felt so kind of evergreen um, but we had a uh, news bulletin updates on our twitter um, that were that were kind of uh, designed as if they were news um uh, screenshot screen grabs from a live news broadcast um, that would update you on kind of key plot points which again is another kind of little anchor um where we would try to and, and the digital groundings did them, this themselves often as well but uh, we always tried to approach it in terms of who's watching this for the first time has no idea what this play is might not even have seen shakespeare before what kind of little hooks can we give them to cling to to be able to go oh okay I, I think I can dial into this I think I get what's going on you know because obviously the language does take some time to adjust um, but the the actual groundlings themselves are amazing at that um, YouTube has a random algorithm where it'll pitch random people in <laughs> and they'll be like what am I watching and they'll be like oh it's this we're at this point this has just happened this is where we're going it's going to be great stick around and they would like really encourage that kind of inclusivity um, and, and the atmosphere and the culture that was um, developed organically uh, by the digital groundlings, I think was one of the great kind of wins of the whole experience. Yeah, um, yeah, I think it's, um, I think it, it, the, one of the things that was, was was really nice you know obviously I, I kind of was in the digital groundings regularly other you know some but then equally even as a, a, you know when you're watching on catch up um that chat stays there as part of um part of the part of the production you know so you save the live chat if you go back and watch you can see what people were talking about and it's 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 that kind of it becomes a paratext it becomes like a time capsule 
of what was happening around the time that that production was happening. And so it gives you that extra context and, and really gives you um, something that it, it just adds that something extra. I mean, you can, or you can, of course, you could watch the, the, the productions when they were performed live, you could just watch them full screen and not really have any clue what was going on in the chat if you chose to do so. But it gives you, it's almost like a, a sort of, almost like a director's commentary in some ways, not a director, obviously, because it was not you, Rob, but, but it was like a, a kind of additional commentary going along. Yeah. So, um, so, so yeah, it was, it's fascinating. And, and I mean, in terms of the, the, you talked a little bit about, you could see what the groundlings were reacting to and how they were, you know, responding, whether they're particular bits that they kind of were impressed by or liked or whatever. Um, did that influence how you chose to do things in future productions? 100% it did, yeah, yeah, very much so. So um, a TV company would spend hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to get the kind of insights that we were getting for free through the mechanic of uh, the YouTube chat and people's high level of engagement in it. Um, I've seen other um, kind of uh, live streams of YouTube things where the chat is nowhere near as active. So I, for whatever reason, there was a particular excitability and a willingness to, to respond <laughs> uh, viscerally in the moment from our audience, which, which was such a gift. Um, but it absolutely meant that we could see when things were landing, when, when you know, certain camera moves were being interpreted cor correctly, if you like, or as intended. Um, and that meant that, oh, okay, so that reads. So that's something that we can work on, we can build on, we can continue to explore and kind of stretch uh, how we apply that particular technique. Um, similarly, um, you know, we, we made a uh, decision very early on that we weren't going to use virtual backgrounds um, because, again, we wanted that shared space. So I'm in my bedroom, you're in yours. Um, yes, yeah, exactly, Gemma. So that, uh, the, you can also go and see that uh, the, the, the uh, digital groundings are often finding community and communion with each other um, around the play, not just about the play. Uh, and I think that was actually really, really important. Um, I think the fact that if you go back, as you say, and you can see the live chat still there, you will see people talking about things that aren't the play. Um, that's great because it, it gives you the sense of um, togetherness that people were really craving while they were all isolated and apart. Yeah, definitely. And if I can just uh, quickly yeah. mention another kind of, if folks are, are thinking about, um, you know, the differences that we can start to analyze between a grassroots digital theater series, such as the show must go online and some of the more establishments, some of the, the, the you know, moneyed venues. Um, for me, and I would be fascinated to hear other folks who probably know a lot more about um, those differences than I do. Uh, for me, one of the big differences was this element of community that, that so many of us in kind of a, a live uh, theater world know about how theater is great for building community. And you really see that in the show must go online because you have a lot of the same folks coming back week after week, whether it's performers or people who were performers who are now in the chat or people who were in the chat who then became performers or sometimes academics would then shift over to a performance register. And it was fascinating to see friends and colleagues in, in that different world. Um, so I, I would be fascinated to, to hear um, both those. And, and for example, Rob, I know we've talked a little bit, maybe you could say a word about how kind of an, an actor who had played one role, sometimes you have that role in mind when that you see that actor play a little bit different role in the future and, and you have someone who plays a part or plays a part you didn't expect them to play. Um, so so yeah, that's absolutely. the community. Yeah, so I, I think one, one of the big kind of uh, foundation, one of the many founding uh, values uh, was inclusivity. And one of the forms of inclusivity that's often overlooked is level of experience. So while we were absolutely trying to be inclusive of uh, gender, race, class, orientation, all the, all the uh, kind of protected characteristics, um, one of the things that rarely gets um, kind of uh, put into the equation is just passion for it. Uh, and so we had people that were absolutely not actors coming in and acting and saying the words out loud. Because to me, the way that this is gonna to continue to have a life, uh, by this I mean Shakespeare, um, is that it is for everyone. And when we say it's for everyone, we don't mean just to passively receive, we mean actually to proactively engage with and to do on its feet out loud with vitality and breath. So uh, that's something that we really wanted to encourage. And that's something that we definitely saw happen. I think in terms of uh, what you're talking about there, Jeff, with um, kind of different, different actors, horses for courses, we definitely had a mix of specialists. Um, so the one that I'm thinking of is Steve Leesk, who played Don Amado. You will find him in all the clown roles <laughs> that would have been played by uh, Kemp, uh, because he's actually a massive fan of Kemp. And I believe he's even developing a one-man show about Kemp. Uh, and his, his, his kind of clowning and his joy comes from uh, kind of getting inside that experience. Uh, and we were very happy to facilitate that because he's amazing. Uh, 
but uh, similarly, you would have someone that will come in in a kind of smaller ensemble role. I think particularly of Ruth Page, um, who came in and played Clifford. It's a really small role, but it has a, a set speech where uh, he dies with an arrow through his neck and gives a monologue for like 10 minutes. It's amazing. Uh, we cut it and it's still too long. It's incredible. Um, uh, but Ruth did a, just an astonishing job of actually active listening was the, was the thing that I was like, ah, this is an actor who's always switched on. And then when it came to Henry V, that's quite a jump. But we knew from what, the little bit that we'd seen that that was someone that we could uh, trust with a role like that. And, you know, we're talking about favourite shows. <laughs> that, is a, that performance will knock your absolute socks off. It's amazing. When we had our Groundlings Choice Awards, Ruth won uh, the, histories, le the lead in a histories category by the largest margin of any of the votes <laughs> because it's just sensational. So I highly recommend you check it out. Yeah. No, that's amazing. Um, I'm just going to pick up on a couple of comments. I don't know if I haven't spotted any more questions, so I'm going to pick up a couple of comments and then I'm going to take chairs, chairs prerogative and ask another question. Um, so Andrew just said, I think the interaction of the digital groundlings and the warmth of the atmosphere, both before and after the production from the cast, crew and presenters was really valuable at a time when we were all trapped in our homes. And I think that's that really captures one big thing that really was achieved by that sort of week by week um, Thing. And I think um, I think it was Ben Crystal who said, you know, that that was something that was really powerful in a time when we didn't, you know, lots of the things that were routine that were every day were just, you know, we didn't have a routine. And then to have something that you can sort of have to lean on to know that it's going to be there each week, and there might be some familiar faces, but equally, if, if there are new faces, it's a, it's almost like a safe place to be as well that something that's a routine and a regular thing um and i know that every single time you've you've come back with you know so obviously the um the the first folio series ended in november but then you did your christmas show and then you did um so you did um pericles and galatea um you've got two noble kinsmen coming out you did the month of marlow as well so every time it's come back people have been so grateful and and happy to have that space to return to but I know that obviously people have continued those kind of friendships and, and online kind of connections even when you haven't been doing it week after week but I think that really talks to um, something you know a, a really powerful thing to have achieved in a time when that connection was so hard to find. Um, I'm, I'm just going to ask I'm not sure if there's um, any other questions so I don't think there is we've only got about five minutes left so I'm going to say um, this evening we've got um, a watch along for um, the production of Macbeth that you did in October um, and prior to that we also have we're incredibly grateful that uh, Mariam Grace who plays Macbeth and Merrin Lee who plays Macduff in that production have are coming online at seven o'clock UK time to do a QA. and a um, so we've, we're hugely looking forward to them speaking to us about that and then obviously the chance to watch along um so the watch along will start at so the q a ends at 7 30 so we to kind of give people a bit of a buffer we're then starting pressing play at 7 40 um but i just wondered if you could give a little bit of insight um into that production what you would want people to kind of go into that production thinking about and also jeff i know one of your students you know obviously did look at that production so what were the kind of things that they got from it absolutely jeffrey do you want to start go ahead rob <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so I think things to bear in mind with this production, uh, it is uh, an all female and non binary uh, production of Macbeth. Um, and uh, it's kind of, again, trying to uh, promote, I guess, our values of inclusivity through the casting. So you've got people that are of all levels of experience playing roles of various sizes. Um, anecdotally, things to ask Maz about, I suppose, uh, Marianne. Uh, are the fact that she campaigned for the role. So she she sent me, uh, I think it was, I think it might have only been one, but it was a detailed email uh, yeah. about uh, how much um, she uh, kind of identified with that part. We'll probably never get a, a, another opportunity to play it uh, and therefore would really appreciate um, the chance to do it here. Uh, and it was because of that passion uh, that we uh, that we cast her uh, in that role. Uh, and I think she does a, an amazing job of it. Um, other things to bear in mind, I think this is a really good, so is it one of those watershed productions? I think the first one was Julius Caesar, where Zoom allowed new capabilities of like having soundscapes in the in the background, uh, so that you could create these kind of shared atmospheres, almost like room tones, 
um, that would unify uh, the, the virtual space uh, that little bit more. And we really pushed that in this production, uh, What With The Supernatural. Um, our witches are on three different continents. So the witches circle literally spans the world. Uh, so I think that's just a fun bit of trivia to know about it. Um, and uh, it's one of those uh, shows where, because we're right on the edge of our seats, our, um, our sound designer is still programming sound cues for the second half while the show is live on. And there is a moment, see if you can spot it, when he accidentally plays cues from the second half in the first half. <laughs> So, uh, again, just these proof of liveness and these kind of edge of your seat, uh, kind of visceral experiences that um, some people may interpret uh, as flaws if you're going with a capital P professional attitude. Uh, but for me, in terms of proof of liveness uh, and proof of uh, shared experience, for me, actually, those moments where things go slightly haywire uh, are the moments where the shows get most exciting. Um, so I think uh, don't, don't be afraid to kind of engage with those um and uh, anything else to talk about um there's a fascinating discussion in the uh, after show uh, by janet who is our fight choreographer uh, who actually breaks down that process so if you're interested in the fight scenes that were covered in henry the sixth uh, we've got janet back in this one uh, actually doing some of the fighting and talking about it in the post-show chat uh, just real quickly i would, I would mention uh, tsmgo's macbeth is a really really good learning opportunity for students who are thinking about gender and sexuality and the ethics of the language that we use. Um, you know, think about how much has changed in the past 10 years, in the past 20 years, since I was a first year student in college. Um, and often our, our students are so much further ahead on this than, than teachers are, but often students are a little bit unsure, anxious about using language. We always, a lot of us in our classes talk about, you know, pronoun inclusivity and, and gender inclusivity and, and the way that we make sure that we're inviting everyone and, and how that's, a skill you know, that you have to develop. Those are techniques that you develop to be inclusive. Being able to see the show must go online as Macbeth actors really kind of embrace and perform how to do gender inclusivity is, is really valuable for students who are, might be writing about this, um, for classes to be able to, to develop skills for talking about gender and sexuality in inclusive ways. That, that for me was one of the big takeaways from Macbeth. One final thing really quickly, the porter scene, the internet connection goes haywire. So we have a Patreon exclusive where we reshot the scene <laughs> and I will uh, and endeavor to send you the link to that, Ben, uh, so that you have that, uh, so you can share it with your audience so that they can see it as intended, the kind of George Lucas remaster. Of that scene. <laughs> I like Cause it. It. Just because like Nat's work is so good that it's, it's worth seeing twice. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, an extra <laughs> and, and in the quite, background of things. <laughs> quick follow-up note on that. Um, Arba was initially going to write an entire essay about the Porter scene and she, so each of these students proposed three different possible essay topics. There is so much from the show that must go online that we haven't talked about today. We've given you just the smallest slice of everything that's available in these plays. We haven't even covered how techniques for digital theater developed over the course of doing all of these different plays. There's so much good content in here to, to give to students that scholars can write about that we've only scratched the surface of. No, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, so I think, yeah, we've, we're pretty much bang on our, our time. So I just want to say thank you so much once again for what was an incredible plenary, a absolutely wonderful discussion, um, some really, really just valuable, invaluable insights into the production process and the afterlife, the, the, the educational work that you're doing. Um, it's been absolutely phenomenal, a real pleasure um, to to, to, to talk to you both and hear you speaking and, and, and be part of this plenary. So thank you. Um, and thank you beyond, on behalf of the whole committee as well, because we were incredibly grateful.